Thanks for watching. This is TC McCarthy. What am I going to talk about today? Well, we've all seen it. You know, the guy with the ripped muscles, the tribal tattoos, the beard. He's got to be some sort of special ops, ex-special ops guy just returned from Afghanistan in the sandbox. So he knows what he's talking about when he starts going on about military science fiction and what weapons are better than others. Maybe not. Stay tuned. You'll find out why. Maybe you need to be careful of those guys because they really don't know what they're talking about. Hey, you've tuned in to T.C. McCarthy, the most handsome and entertaining science fiction author on video. And um, today we're going to go into a topic that really uh, is a little bit different direction than what I've done in past videos. I've been past videos. I've been sticking with things like history of U.S. space travel, dangers of space travel, mysteries of the universe, those sorts of things. But at its core, this channel is about military science fiction. So you'll also see some weaponry, weaponry thrown in there, uh, some strategic insights, those sorts of things, and some discussions of my past and future books, current books I've got work that I've got to work on. Uh, so it's it's a hodgepodge that's centered around the, the, the subject of science fiction and more specifically, military science fiction. Now, buy my book, Tiger Burning. Pre-order it right now. It comes out in July 2019. I put a video right here, pew pew, uh, why, that, why pre-ordering is so important to me. Back to the topic at hand. Listen, in military science fiction, if you go to conventions and stuff, there's this kind of sense that like, you have to have done time in the services or uh, somehow doing time in the services really gives you a kind of gravitas, right? And, uh, and the sense that you know what you're talking about if you're an ex-operator. And uh, that couldn't be farther from the truth. I know some great military science fiction books written by people who don't have any kind of trigger time or experience in combat. Now, some of those people were in the military and served, but they never saw action, never, never got the combat rifleman's badge, stuff like that. But then at the other end of the spectrum are this, this kind of, there's this tendency that uh, maybe you can fake it, right? And I won't go as far as accusing those types of people as honor thieves, but pretty darn close. And uh, they're definitely guilty of some behavior that I would never engage in. And I, I thought it important to go ahead and point out, you know, what to look for. If you're an avid science fiction buff, if you enjoyed my military science fiction books, other military science fiction books, uh, but you're not really engaged with the kind of science fiction community, this video is for you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and name a bunch of people who have military experience, who, who know what they're talking about, and if you get these guys' books, then you're pretty much guaranteed to have some sort of you know, um, knowledge that they, they derived from having served their country for a number of years. But before I get to that, we're gonna talk about the less tasteful side of the equation. These guys in the science fiction community who, uh, who engage in some pretty uh, interesting behavior, let's just say. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna do a countdown list of the things you as a reader or as a fellow author or aspiring author, whoever you are, these are the things you should look for when you're, you're taking a look at a, at a potential book written by somebody who claims to be a military expert. First of all, for those types of people, the phonies, it's all about being, I got a, I've got a microphone in front of me so I can't really move around. That's why I tend to sit here rigid. Um, <laughs> it's all about the beard, right? It, you got to have that beard that looks like it was grown in the mountains of Afghanistan when you were kind of with special forces, you know, working with the local tribes. Uh, so you'll see that beard. Go back. If you've got an author who, who claims to be an expert in this field, go back and look through a history of pictures. When did that beard first show up? Right? When did it show up? Did it show up? Has he always had it? Or she? Well, I, maybe some women can have beards, I guess. Um, have they always had that beard? Or is it a new arrival? Right? That might give you some clue. Number two, tattoos. Tattoos. I'll say it again. Tattoos. Look, I see this at the range all the time. I'm an avid shooter and, and proponent of the Second Amendment. And um, I see this at the range where guys I, I've known or seen before had no tats. Then all of a sudden, you know, a year passes. All of a sudden, they're covered with tribal tats, uh, including the Punisher one made famous by Chris Kyle, I guess, or whatever unit he was with. And uh, it, it, it looks very military. They've got the beard. They've got the tattoos. Looks good. Looks authentic. But those guys have never stepped foot out of the country. I live in a rural part of South Carolina. Many guys here have lived here all their lives and never gone anywhere. And that certainly fits the bill. So that adds to it. Number two, beyond the beard, if this author has tattoos, go look and see when they got them. Are those a new arrival? 
Because look, at its heart, the, you know, we're in the sales business. We're trying to sell our books. And some people will go to any length, great lengths, to sell their books along with their image. There's this tendency to feel like you've got to portray an image to the audience, even if that image is not authentic. I'm not okay with that. Some people are. I, that just rubs me the wrong way. I guarantee you those people who went out and spent all that money on tribal tats, their, their moms probably cried for days when they saw what their little boy had done to their skin. And then the second thing to look for, the guys who scream out every military topic, they scream out, I'm an expert on that. I know everything about that. I'm the guy to talk to about that. And uh, if you've been to a science fiction convention where there's a contingent of military science fiction writers, you may have seen this before. I remember one of my earliest conventions, I have a, a Chris Vector that I built myself, right? I had to get the tax stamp. So it's basically a short barreled rifle, uh, caliber 45. If I had the military or police version, this would be basically a submachine gun. So I was very happy about it. And I started talking to this fellow author about it. And the first question I got from him was basically, uh, is, it, is it blowback or is it gas powered? And I didn't want to embarrass the guy. I was kind of like, you know, dude, what? <laughs> Look, listen, submachine guns, they're used very extensively by counterterrorism units. And um, this guy was arguing there, that submachine guns have no place on the battlefield today, which is BS, complete BS. Now, if you're talking about uh, submachine guns like the Chris Vector, maybe not. Right, that's a that's a submachine gun is basically it's sub rifle caliber, right? So this is this is shooting pistol caliber ammunition, 40 caliber ACP, right? And uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a heavy round, it's a great round, but it's not necessarily enough for some of the people who are doing CQB and clearing houses and want something close in that's going to be guaranteed to stop. Even a big round like the 45 isn't necessarily a guarantee. Necessarily a guarantee. Plus, the Chris Vector has a, a rate of fire that's insane. It's really high. You drain one of those 30-round magazines in, in a second. I mean, it's just so fast if it's the submachine gun variant. So this guy was arguing, no, 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 that's a useless weapon. No no submachine guns on the battlefield, which, which is BS. Now, there are two things about this argument that were BS. Yes. Number one, when he asked me gas powered versus blowback, I was thinking to myself, dude, um, I'm not aware of any submachine guns that are gas powered, but I didn't, you know, I was, I was being nice. I didn't want to embarrass the guy. So I was kind of like, geez, I don't know. You know, I played nice, played dumb. And right off the bat, he counted that as a victory. I mean, it was a very smug interaction. And I thought, Oh man, I should have embarrassed this guy. I was really pissed about it at the time. And um, now there may be some obscure, some machine guns out there that I'm not aware of that are that are gas powered. Uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, basically, uh, you know, when you look at fully automatic weapons, troop carried weapons, not I'm not talking about like you know crew served machine guns, full on machine guns. I'm talking about assault rifles, those sorts of those sorts of platforms. The, some of the popular American assault rifles are in fact gas powered. The rifle fires a shot, the bullet starts to exit the barrel, gas going out the barrel is fed through a series of tubes, and that gas is then used to blow the bolt back, chamber the next round, and fire again, right? So that is gas powered. Now in a blowback system, very much like you have in an automatic pistol, a semi-automatic pistol, uh, as, the, as the, um, the bullet is fired, the gas from the explosion directly pushes the, the, uh, the bolt back into the next position where it can cycle and fire again. That latter one is how most submachine guns work. Again, I could be wrong that there may be a few out there that are gas powered and I'm not aware of them. Please let me know in the comments. The point is, um, I thought it was a stupid question and I was being nice, my fault, my mistake. I will never make that mistake again. The second thing about his question in terms of submachine guns or his sp statement, submachine guns have no place on the battlefield today. I can see what somebody might think in terms of range, right? You don't get a lot of range with these things. So in the desert and current conflicts, yeah, there's probably no place. But if we go back to the jungle, uh, see North Africa, uh, if we go back to fighting in the jungle or in areas where we will have a lot of CQB, now we did have a lot of CQB in Baghdad and I would imagine that uh, there were instances where, where submachine guns were judged to be useful in those situations. Oh wait, I don't have to imagine. I know one right off the top of my head. When you look at special operations forces, Green Berets, SEALs, all those guys, 
Some of them insist on having submachine guns as part of their kit, and they train with them, train like they fight, and when they get these submachine guns, they know that their, their adversaries might be wearing body armor, and so what they do during training, they start firing at the crotch, which is usually unarmored, and then work their way up to the head. So they, they take care of that issue of having pistol caliber ammunition with some carefully aimed shots. So yes, it has a ho home on the battlefield with special operations forces for the purpose of most likely clearing buildings. Number two, there I can't remember the, the I'll put a, a picture of it up here. They're, they're developing submachine gun um, platforms that actually use kind of a, a scaled down rifle. Um, rifle round. So those are coming online or have been online for a while, I think. I'll have to double check on this. I work most of these videos from memory, so you have to excuse me if I make a mistake. But um, uh, I know that there's a platform, and I don't know if it's 556, 223, I have to look. But it's a, a submachine gun that fires rounds like that that have been cut down, and apparently it just the penetrating power on those things, forget about body armor. I mean, this thing's going to slice right through a lot of the different types of body armor that we might see uh, used by terrorists. So does the submachine gun have a place on the battlefield? You bet it does. And we haven't even talked about counterterrorism applications. You see submachine guns all around. So this idea that the submachine gun is useless, nah, that's, that's BS. Is it gonna have limited application now? That might be an argument. That might be an argument that I'm willing to concede to. But useless, uh, that, that's a, a bridge too far in my opinion. The third thing you want to look for in these, these people who claim, you know, to claim to have all this experience but may not actually have it is that, uh, and I kind of mentioned this back in number two, is that these people will basically claim to be the expert in everything. And here I'm talking about somebody who's constantly engaging in one-upsmanship. We have that in our personal lives. I'm sure everyone watching this video knows somebody who just has to be the best at every single field. You know, you're at dinner, you're at a cookout or whatever, and this guy's constantly one-upping your stories, right? Well, those people tend to be insecure. And we see that in authors as well, who want all, you know, they want all these accolades, they want all this attention, right? And uh, the same is true for military science fiction authors. Some of them take it too far. And so you'll run into these people who basically claim to be things that they're not. And uh, the, I used this example early, earlier on. I've seen authors basically claim to be quote unquote spies. Well, I can tell you with certainty, just Google this, spies are people that our country recruits to spy on their own home country, right? So there's a terminology problem there with anybody who claims to be a spy. Uh, that's just not the way that uh, we refer to, to certain types of people. Spies are assets. Spies are foreigners. Spies are people that we turn to, to use against their own government to benefit ours, right? So it's, it's virtually impossible for a US citizen to claim to be a spy unless he's spying for Russia or some other country against us, right? And I don't think I don't think that's what's going on here when I hear people in the, in the writing community talk about that stuff. But doesn't sound like a big deal. Maybe it isn't a big deal, but it's just another indicator that you should scratch your head at and go, uh, right? And, and uh, I've done that a lot with certain authors in this field. And then lastly, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, you got to look at the service this person um, is affiliated with. If it's, if it's not a ground service, right? If he's not a ground pounder and uh, this person's writing books about infantry combat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's not necessarily the case that he's writing from experience. He might have to do a lot of research or she might have to do a lot of research, and, and which is fine. That is perfectly fine. Uh, I'm that way. I'm open about the fact that I've never seen combat. I've never shot at anybody. I've never been fired at. Uh, but I write tons of books about military um, uh, science fiction in military science fiction where you know infantry combat is the the the, the main thing or the main focus of the book uh, I do a lot of research go take a look at my past videos on this in fact the last video I did talked about a lot of the research that goes into to the books that I write so you know there's no problem with writing about something with which you have no experience um, as long as you're open about it if you if you try to couch yourself as this tactical expert on infantry combat infantry weapons etc 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 when you have no experience in that field whatsoever but it may you make it sound like you do that's just 
that's wrong. That's bogus. You guys may not have a problem with that. I do. And um, so I'm giving you that tip as well. Look at their service record and, and try and get a sense of it. Did this person actually serve um, as an infantry offer, officer, as an infantryman, as a Marine, uh, maybe even in, in the Navy as a, um, as a corpsman or a SEAL or something that engaged them in ground combat. Air Force, you know, was, was this person a PJ, he or she? Was this person involved in something ground related in the Air Force that put them in harm's way. I have a brother-in-law. He was a K-9 unit guy. He's an Air Force K-9 unit guy. The Marines, all the services wanted him uh, to go out in the field with them when he was deployed. Uh, he was deployed multiple times when he was deployed in the sandbox. And so he would go out on ground combat missions. So there are reasons in these services why you would be deployed in ground combat. I'm not saying somebody who's in the Navy doesn't know anything about infantry combat. All I'm saying is your mileage may vary. Make sure to check it out if this is important to you. All right, so you've made it this far. I've talked about signs to look for, for with, with military science fiction authors who might not have the, the experience that he or she claims to have. Who are the real deal, right? From my experience, who are the real deal? Well, I'm gonna go down a list and I want you to go check out these guys' books. Oddly enough, they all seem to gravitate toward Bain Books, who's my publisher. Um, so I scratch my head at that one, uh, but you know, you can find a lot of these guys if you go to the Bain Book website. Otherwise, you can find their books on Amazon, Bar Barnes & Noble, all over the place. Some of them are New York Times bestsellers. Now, not all of them are Bain Book authors, but, but a lot of these are. So here we go, starting with number one, David Drake. David Drake served in the army and he was um, deployed in, I think it was the 70s, may have been the 60s, to Vietnam. So he has seen time in Vietnam. Joe Haldeman, also in the army, also deployed in Vietnam. I think he was a combat engineer. He had some great stories about uh, uh, helicopter drops uh, with chainsaws and all sorts of gear that he had to go in with uh, to build stuff under fire and everything. It was, he's, he's a really interesting guy. If you've seen earlier videos, I love him. Uh, I love David Drake too. I've been to his house, been to cookouts there. David is uh, is a really down to earth guy, really fun to talk to, very friendly. Both of these guys are just total gentlemen. Sean Hazlett. Now he's an up and comer. He writes a lot of short stories. I think he published, and or no, he didn't publish. He, I know he's been shopping around one novel. I don't know the status of it. We communicate on Facebook. Uh, but this is a guy who served in the army. He's a tanker. He was deployed in Europe during the Gulf War, so I don't think he actually saw any combat, but dude, this guy served on tanks for his entire career in the Army. He knows what he's talking about. Brad Torgerson. And you got to check this guy out. Bane author, uh, Chaplain's War, I think was his first novel published. Brad, I'm sorry if I got that wrong, but you got to check out Brad's work. He's fantastic. He's an award winner. He's published uh, multiple short stories in Asimov's Ooh, he's gonna get mad at me. No, analog, analog. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. But Brad, Brad serves in the army. I think he's a warrant officer and he's seen multiple deployments uh, in current conflicts. Keith Lawmer. Now, I don't know much about Keith, uh, but I think that this guy did time in World War II in the army. So he definitely saw some, uh, some interesting things. Gene Wolfe. Army, Korean War. Hal Clement. World War II bomber, right? This guy, wow. He was a heavy bomber pilot. I wish I could remember which one. I don't know if it was B-24, B-17, B-29, but he's a heavy bomber pilot. If you go and look at the life expectancy for bomber crews in World War II, not good. John Ringo. John Ringo served and he got his combat infantry badge. Infantryman's badge? Man, I'm getting old. I'm forgetting simple stuff. Anyway, the guy saw combat, and he's published a lot of books. He's a New York Times bestselling author. If you haven't read his books, just go buy one. Robert Heinlein. Bob. He served in the Navy, uh, and I think it was pre-World War II Navy. But when World War II broke out, he, he felt so patriotic and felt so much obligation to his country, he tried to re-enlist. Tom Kratman. Now, I think Tom Kratman may have been Special Forces. I'm not sure if he was a Ranger. I'm not sure if he was an actual Green Beret. But Tom Kratman is somebody who definitely served, um, and I believe that he served during the Gulf War. So he saw some action, knows what he's talking about. Now, I'm going to butcher this guy's name. I've never met him. Weston Osh. 
something like that. You can look him up. I think he, he does uh, SEAL Team 666. <laughs> he, um, I've never read his books, but I love the concept. And he served in the Army as, I think, an intelligence officer. Nick Cole. Now, this guy, Galaxy's Edge, go check it out. This guy is a grinder. He works so hard. Self-published. He has an interesting story about how the publishing world basically kicked him out, and I can relate to that story with, with my experiences in big publishing and the, the kind of um, almost radical leftist views that are held by some editors. But uh, now he's publishing his stuff on his own with a partner, Jason... Um, I can't remember Jason's name, but it doesn't matter. Who I'm talking about is Nick Cole, served in the Army. And then last but not least, Stephen Lawson. Now, this is somebody, I think, who served both in the Army and the Navy. So please go check out Stephen or Steve's books. I haven't read them. I need to check them out myself as well. And that's the end of our list. Those are the names that I'm relatively sure have, have served uh, in the armed forces. The, they, are, they have experience, at least most of the time, with ground combat or, or infantry slash marine experience. Now, there are, there are a couple of Navy guys in there, so I can't speak to their ground combat experience or lack thereof, but great starting point. That's where I would start if I was looking at military science fiction and if it was important to me to have been written from somebody who might actually have some direct experience with you know, combat itself. So let me wrap it up. Please buy my book, Tiger Burning. Again, it's available July 2nd. You can pre-order it now. End transmission. Hey, TC McCarthy here, the most eclectic and entertained science fiction author on YouTube, maybe even the internet. Thanks for watching this video. I really appreciate you guys tuning in. As usual, buy my books. I've got a new one coming out in July and uh, I'll have a giveaway coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. Appreciate you subscribing to my channel and please, 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 please don't forget to click that little bell icon so that whenever I upload new content, you get notified. Thanks again. See you soon.